All right. Um, so welcome to uh, Beyond 120 workshop on translating language skills into uh, a career. Uh, my name is Joe Orser. I'm Global Engagement Coordinator with the Beyond 120 program. Uh, and today as guests, we have um, Kathleen Diamond of ALC Bridge, and she'll talk more about that organization in a little bit. Um, and Kristen Quinlan, um, who's CEO of Certified Languages International. Um, before we get started, uh, one thing that I wanted everyone to do um, is uh, in the chat box uh, to go ahead and type uh, what languages um, other than English uh, do you speak, do you speak, uh, read, uh, or write? That will give us um, an opportunity, especially our guests, an opportunity to see um, what all we're working with in terms of languages. Um, uh, but it'll also give you a chance to kind of see um, you know, what what your class, what what your uh, what the, your fellow workshop attendees, what languages they are working with. Um, if at any point, uh, feel free. You have a question, feel free to submit it to the chat box. We will have time at the end to kind of go through questions and answers. Um, and if we don't get to your question immediately, I'll apologize. Um, we have goodness gracious, sixty-seven wow. participants. Um, so there's a chance we may not get to your question, even if you do uh, do submit it in timely fashion into the chat box. Um, but go ahead, as I say, in the chat box, uh, indicate what languages uh, you re speak, read, or write. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to um, plug a couple of upcoming events that Beyond 120 is doing, specifically workshops similar in format to this. This Friday, um, uh, Dr. Jacob Watson, who is uh, our um, research coordinator, um, is going to be hosting a workshop on undergraduate research poster presentation. Uh, there's a uh, link there that if you if you screenshot this slide, you can uh, go to that link. Also, if you screenshot this slide, you can see at the bottom um, that we have um, uh, all of these events are, are at advising.ufl.edu slash beyond 120 slash events and the links and descriptions are there. And then next Tuesday, um, which I think this is this sounds really exciting. We have a, a workshop called How to Network in Today's Evolving World. And in my classes with Beyond 120, I'm always uh, emphasizing the importance of networking. And so I would encourage all of y'all to attend that workshop with um, Adam Grossman, co-founder and chief operating officer of The Selling Factory. Both of those um, workshops sound fantastic. Um, all right, I'm going to stop there with, um, with the general announcements and I'm going to turn uh, things over to uh, Kathleen Diamond, again, uh, a board member of the Association of Language Companies in a ALC Bridge. Um, and perhaps Kathleen, you can kind of give us a brief introduction to yourself, um, uh, tell us what it is that ALC Bridge does and, and introduce us a little bit to the language services industry. And you'll want me to pull up your slideshow, is that correct? Um, yeah, we'll wait until after um, uh, both of us has finished our personal okay. um, introductions, if that's okay, Joe. That's right. Um, good afternoon, Gators. Uh, I have to say I am absolutely just dumbstruck. Um, I mean, I'm seeing so many faces and so many languages. You're, I mean, this is like, you know, we, we, Kristen and I, we're like bees and we're just coming to your honey because this is amazing to see this much uh, language talent in one place at one time. So let me just catch my breath because this is quite amazing. Um, I, um, my name is Kathleen Diamond indeed, and I am, I am a Gator. I received both my bachelor's and my master's um, from the University of Florida back in the 20th century when there were very few global people on campus. And um, I, um, I, I studied 16th century French literature. <clears throat> I don't expect a lot of wows, um, but that's what I studied. That's what I have my degree in. But I'm here to tell you that the University of Florida, the University of Florida prepared me personally for a life that just has been so full of in, in just absolutely engaging work in my professional life. I've been surrounded by inspiring people from around the globe. 
And of course, I've had nothing but the most stimulating of experiences, um, both in ordinary, simple places like people's backyards or in exotic places and corners of the world. Um, truly, I think I've visited almost every, well, I have visited every continent except Antarctica. Um, and I'm just so proud to be a Gator and to be invited to come on campus and be with you and to encourage you in the passion of language and the opportunities that you now have that I didn't have. Um, when I had my graduation and received my, my degree, my father sort of lamented, um, you know, too bad, Kathleen, you know, smart girl, you could have majored in math. <laughs> um, he just couldn't imagine what the heck I was gonna do with this degree. And of course, neither could I because the, the horizon was rather narrow in those days. Basically one had a degree in languages and one went to teach, which is fine, but it isn't really what I had in mind. So I got the degrees, I tried to teach, I did teach. I even uh, was an instructor on campus at the University of Florida for a couple of years. Um, I did some teaching at Augusta College in Georgia. I did some teaching in high school. And then I ran out of jobs, there were no jobs. So I found myself um, in a bit of a pickle because I, I didn't have a backup. I didn't have some other idea of what I could do with my language uh, career. So I used my wits and I figured out if I couldn't find someone to hire me, then I would hire other people. And over a nice glass of French brandy, I decided that I would become an entrepreneur. Now you have to understand, there was no entrepreneurship in my, com in my, in my family, in my heritage. My father worked for a large corporation all his life, the same one. And here I am, I'm gonna be an entrepreneur. But luckily for me, I had learned in this great college of yours um, how to think, how to write, how to put together a proposal, and how to respond to opportunity, how to respond to opportunity. And very quickly, very quickly, when I had this glass of brandy and had this awakening that I was going to be an entrepreneur, the Washington Post, I was living in the Washington, D.C. area at the time, posted an article, not an article, a, an advertisement in the, in the Post saying that they were having a seminar on a Saturday for women thinking about starting their own businesses out of their homes. Guess who was in the front row? <laughs> front row. It was at the Mayflower Hotel, downtown Washington, and I was blown away. It was a full day on how to, how to start. You know, you, make, you pick a name, you get a bank account, you find clients. It sounded all totally reasonable. And being a good student, I wrote it all down and then I proceeded to do each of the steps that were on the list I was supposed to do. And I started language learning enterprises, not terribly creative, but the key thing was I focused on the enterprises, the S. I didn't know too much else about language. Certainly I didn't know about a language industry. So I started with that and I got clients, the only thing I knew where to go to find business was the United States government. And in those days, they were buying language training for their officers that they were sending overseas, State Department, Department of Defense. And in those days, you could just walk in, say, you guys buying language services? <laughs> and they, they'd take me down the hall and they'd say, well, you have to, you, you have to, you know, you have, there's, we have RFPs. And I said, RFPs? <laughs> what the heck is that? But they said, well, it's a request for proposal and we'll be putting them out and you'll, you'll respond to them. Well, luckily for me, again, masters in 16th century literature, I figured out how to respond to a proposal. And I won my first contract with um, the State Department. And I said, this is good. This is looking good. So I filled out the proposal. I won it. And then the contracting officers wanted to see my site. I said, my site? They said, well, yeah, your classrooms. I said, my classrooms? 
I found myself in a pickle again. But this time I was ready. I had thought about the problem and I came up with the solution and the solution was simple. I figured out that in Washington DC, churches would have the best classrooms not being used from Monday through Friday. So I went to the best church, St. John's, the famous one across the, from the White House, talked to the pastor, said, what are you doing with your classrooms on Monday through Friday? Oh, nothing. I said, could I rent them? And they said, and he said, yes. And I rented six classrooms, took the contracting officer over. I said, don't worry about the little chairs and the little tables, we'll figure that out when you first give me a student. Well, darned if he didn't, they didn't have students right away. First student was a Japanese student and I was off. And every step of the way, it was like, okay, this is the enterprise I'm talking about. Long story short, the company grew. We added translation, we added uh, interpreting. And I begin to understand about what it is that I'm here to talk to you about today with my big buddy, Kristen. And that is that we have an industry that people just don't know about it because we keep it quiet, we keep it hidden. And my father, uh, when the company made its first million said, you know what, you are a smart girl, good decision. So that's sort of my story and how I came to <clears throat> this industry that is now becoming truly so large and, and amazing. And I think what I'd like to do now is to sort of move in, we can, you can, I can take questions later, but move in to the discussion of what it is that we bring to you um, in the 21st century as you're thinking about your careers. So if I may, I'd like to introduce a great friend and colleague. And she is somebody that just to me exemplifies the beauty of the language services industry in her person, in her company, in her passion. And um, it just so happens, because life is coincidence, but not really, as you can tell, um, it's taking opportunities. Her father was a great mentor of mine and a big helper to me as I was growing my business. So she and I are, we're close. Kristen, thank you so much to come to this, for, for coming to the swamp with me. You, you are welcome. Um, my story is not quite as linear, and it is a story of just happen chance and always saying yes, um, or sometimes reluctantly saying yes. But first of all, I'm here in Portland, Oregon. I'm a uh, University of Oregon duck. My children are fifth generation ducks. So I'm glad we're not in the same league because then we might have something to, um, to argue about. Um, Anyways, I was an English literature major, not a French literature major, but an English literature major from the University of Oregon, having no clue what I was going to do with my life. I thought as a um, as as I could back uh, fall into being a school teacher, but I just really don't like little kids that much, and so that wasn't that interesting. Um, but I got out of college, um, took a sailing trip of about six months up through Alaska, and back, and then and then settled down to find a real job. Well, there was a family friend of a friend who had uh, was a Distributor for Pioneer Electronics. I didn't know electronics. This is back in the 90s. But I learned electronics and I went to work for Pioneer Electronics and climbed the ladder and did really great. But it was um, when I had my first child, it was a lot of nights, a lot of weekends, all days, every day. And I said, you know, I need to do something different. So I got into the world of semiconductors. <laughs> no clue what a semiconductor was. I went to school in Long Island in New York to learn what semiconductors were. I'm an English literature major who, who told my children in third grade, if they ever ask me a question about math again, they're grounded. So here I am in this world of computers and semiconductors, but you know what? I could sell anything. And what you do is you learn the intricacies and then you go and you assimilate and make friends with the electrical engineers that are designing in these diodes and these whatevers. And, and, I, and I did great, but it was a, um, it was, that was back in the nineties when the internet was just kicking up when everything was starting to have um, technology, uh, but it was still at the, at the early site, but that job about killed me. It was a uh, very male dominated field. I was the only female salesman, which is hilarious because I'm the English literature major. I, but anyways, I did really well, but I, um, I, 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 I lost it. I almost had a nervous breakdown, two kids at this point, And I said, I give up three years into it. I took uh, two and a half, almost three years off to get my youngest to kindergarten. And then I was gonna find a real job. 
And I told my dad that, and my dad is as spirited as, 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 as I'll get out. And he had started, um, back up, my dad is a serial entrepreneur. So he founded our company, Certified Languages, which I'll explain to you what it is in a second. But prior to that, oh gosh, he owned, he was, he was largely in telecommunications, uh, wrote his own DOS programming way, way back before anybody was, was computer programming. But he had a, um, a distillery where he made vodka and gin and, and, and whatnot. And I remember one Mother's Day, we went, little capped it. We were capping the distillery. He had a boat hatch building company in Florida. It was the world's uh, best boat hatch that he designed in to work with, um, with seagoing vessels. Um, he had, uh, well, anyways, a, 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 a lot of businesses. Fast forward, he was asked back in 1995, he was asked to write some, he was um, consulting for something doing, um, thinking around with computer programming and, and a language company who dispatched on-site interpreters to hospitals primarily, found out about my dad and asked if he could write some technology to, to better streamline the dispatching of these interpreters. He's like, yeah. Well, the guy ended up stiffing him. The guy was imprisoning for, for, for a period of time for trading arms with Russia. He was just a bad guy. My dad said, expletive, I can do what you're doing, but only you know, 10 times better. So he left, walked away and started his own company. Well, his company is Certified Languages International because it sounded really professional. Um, there's th that point, there was no certification of, of anything. Um, but his concept was to be able to place interpreters, not necessarily on site where you've got dominant uh, populations, uh, but to be able to provide an interpreter anywhere in any language, regardless of, um, of, of location. And, um, and, but technology wasn't quite that cool yet, but he was a super big forward thinker and knew that he would design it and technology would backfill and he'd be able to do this. But he started out with dispatching interpreters to hospitals and then built it from there. So I can go into intricacies there, but more importantly, where did we stand? Now, back in 1999, <clears throat> I told my dad, we're very close. And I said, yeah, Austin, is my daughter. Austin's heading off to kindergarten. I'm back in the, in, the, in the hunt for a real job. And he's like, why are you doing that? Do you mind coming? And again, Kathleen and I, both in the literature world, I'm a good writer. <laughs> and he said, why don't you come write proposals for me and run something else? I said, I'll give you 20 hours a week and that's all. So I got in because again, he was, he had a lot of companies. Some of them made tons, many, many more failed miserably. And there's one thing about an entrepreneur, a true entrepreneur is they are really, really poor at running a business. They're great at conceptualizing, but the day-to-day -day running of a business is just it, it not interesting enough. So even at this early stage, at three years in, he'd already turned over the keys to the daily operations of his company to some Near do well who he'd hired as a, a, a recruiter, an interpreter recruiter. And this guy was polar op opposite of my dad's spirit and was just not a good leader of the company. And my dad didn't care because it kept on growing. So I went in part time um, and, and, and got involved in the, in the industry. Long story short, I knew the opportunities were abundant, but I didn't know how to get there because I had this, this wall that was running the business that didn't like me in there in the first place because there, I was the daughter and uh, I had no intention of running the business. But anyways, I saw these opportunities. I saw it starting to grow. I quickly left my 20 hours a week and started in sales because we really didn't have a good salesperson. Uh, started in sales and long story short, there's not a job in this company I haven't done outside of answer the phones. Um, in 2006, I ascended to CEO and um, ended up with kind of a mess of a company. We were just barely thriving on a, on a, on a credit line, <laughs> but we got things turned around. I hired an executive in finance and we, and we turned the, the company around and between 2008 and 2019, we made the Inc. 5,500 fastest growing list, company list eight times, which I think two and a half percent of companies globally do that or, or nationally do that. We um, are number three in the world in what we do. And I'm gonna tell you, what do you do? We are an on-demand interpreting service, pretty exclusively. Um, now, cut to the tape. There's interpreting and translating. The words are not interchangeable, even though everybody thinks they are. Everybody who calls on the translator. No, if it's, if it's a spoken word, it's called an interpreter and never make that mistake. Um, translation, translation is the written word. So our company is an on-demand meaning you don't have to schedule, interpreting company that provides services over the phone and now via video as well. We cover 234 languages, 24 by seven. 
we handle between 20,000 and 30,000 calls a day and growing at a pretty significant clip. Um, we're number three in the world in what we do and, uh, and um, we're continuing to grow. So it is, uh, my story is not about, um, sadly, backup, very passionate about languages. I barely passed French three. I got through three years of, of, of French in college and, and the professor asked me to maybe not continue. It's really embarrassing. <laughs> I now travel the world and I do that and I'm still, I learn, I try, but I'm just not adept. But what I am is, is, is my vision's always open. You never say no. You don't, as far as managing a company, I worked in corporate America for, for many years and it was always what the man said and it was top-down management style and it was, and that just was so unmotivating to me. I couldn't bring my, my eldest to his first day of kindergarten. I couldn't go to the, to the holiday play. I couldn't because you're working and you're with me. And I thought if I ever had an opportunity to do something completely opposite, which no, because it's just me, this, you know, ne'er do well. Uh, I run a company that is completely bottom-up management style. I take the calls from the people that are answering the phones. And those are the, those are the people that are the client facing and the most important people in our company. And we go from there. Everything we do from departments is all cross departmental input. Um, it's a very backwards way of running a company, but it happens to be a very successful way of running a company because people feel human and they really like working here. And I'll tell you in the 21 or 22 years that I've been here, I think we've lost two managers everybody else's we have 220 employees we just we've never lost an executive we've never lost a key manager it's just because it's the human spirit and the way that we've that we've grown this company uh but anyways so yeah i we again we cover 234 languages 24 by 7. so you say who are the clients i'm not sure if you're aware well most of you are because every one of you speaks at least two if not five languages and i was so impressed i couldn't see straight when those languages were flying up and really cool ones too anyways um one out of five people speak a language other than english at home here in the united states how do they get goods and service equal to that of the american speaking population it's through interpreting services primarily and through entities that supply staff interpreters um there um about 60 to 65 percent of the business we do is in the hospital and healthcare industry i'm not sure if many of you are aware you're all really smart you probably are but america does not have a national language of origin so not speaking english is considered um a um a, a disability under the um under the 1964 um, um, disabilities act um, and it remains so. So any entity, any organization, any anybody receiving any sort of federal funding must fall under the guidelines of the Americans with Disability Act, among other things. And one of those is the provision of language services. So um, hospitals and healthcare is kind of a no brainer. That's pretty much where our industry started is providing um, interpreting services um, to the hospital and healthcare arena. But we also do um, a large amount of work in um, banking and finance and insurance and K-12 education and some government work, but I don't like it. And um, student rules. And, um, uh, I, you know, we, we do we, we, Tyson Farms chicken. We do BMW collections. We do Tiffany jewelry store collections. Who ever thought that they would <laughs> it would have people that would need to go to club? Well, they call us if they don't speak English. Um, anyways, so that that's in a nutshell um, what we do. And um, as Kathleen had, had said before, my father was just incredibly spirited and an amazing man. He's since passed away, but he, um, when he started this, he didn't know what he was doing. So he'd look around and he'd find anybody else in the country or maybe the world that did something like providing interpreting services that are on demand. So he said, this is baloney. We've got to talk. We've got to talk people. So he found every organization in the country that he can and say, I'm holding a meeting. It's going to be in Portland, Oregon, and you need to come because we need to share ideas. And that was the uh, beginning of the Association of Language Companies which now there's ELIA, the European Language Industry Association, which was a model after the Association of Language Companies. And they all share ideas in the, in the EU primarily um, about best practices. How do we help each other grow? Um, our industry is growing at, at a clip of between five and 8% annually, all organic new business. We stand, and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll go to the size of the business. Yeah. We'll get down there in a sec when we get to the slides. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But it is, um, if there's any message I could, I could leave with 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 college with with you as a college audience that that are really smart and really global. 
the world's your oyster and we're going to go into career opportunities and whatnot, but you are in such a good space. And I'm just tickled pink that there's so many of you that showed up here. So we'll take questions or whatever Thank down the you. road, but we'll get it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kristen. I I um I, I kind of laid out all my cards, which I wasn't intending on doing. Laid out I was going to come cards. across a really smart business entrepreneur CEO, and then oh, here we go. You know, you, <laughs> you got laid out all your cards, and that's why you are so um, absolutely inspiring to me. Um, each and time, each and every time I have meetings with you, and that's quite frequently. So you know, you're pretty good at it. Um, so what 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 I'd like to to introduce. Um, uh, in, in, a, in a conversational way. And if you'll put up the first slide, Joe, um, I will give you the, the creation story uh, of ALC Bridge. Um, <clears throat> the Association of Language Companies has been the best trade association that anybody in the language industry could be in because it's the place where you go to, to learn and to talk to your colleagues and find out um, how you can be a better, a better company. And so a couple of years back, uh, we were having a, one of our annual retreats and it was in the beautiful uh, Sonoma Valley. And I was fortunate enough to be in a small breakout room with about six or seven of our, our peers. And, you know, around the room, the usual questions, you know, what's your pain point or, you know, whatever, uh, business owners talking, you know, and, and it, it was very quickly determined that the problem that the companies were experiencing most deeply, and this was the largest company in the room to the smallest company in the room and everybody in between, was what they called lack of language talent in their pipelines. And everyone just said, whoa. And they said, yes, we, the, the, the people that are coming to us and saying that they can translate or they can interpret can't. They may be bilingual, trilingual, multilingual, but they can't perform the functions that are required by the sorts of jobs that we have. We have documents that have to be translated that are highly scientific and full of chemistry and full of detail and the, the, our applicants cannot handle them. We have individuals who are uh, asked to be interpreters for people on uh, 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 you know, delivering babies in hospitals and they can't do it. So we have a crisis on our hands. We do not have the, the, the language talent um, that we can hire coming up and the demand is just going crazy. So as, as these things happen, you know, there's no way of really explaining it except I was perhaps in the right room, I think at the right time. And folks kind of turned and looked at me and they said, well, you know, Kathleen, you know, you know, you know about academics. Well, of course, by this time I knew nothing about academics, but um, I said, mm, and they said, well, why don't you, you know, it seems like, and I said, I know, it seems like somehow we as employers have got to get out of our boardrooms and go to the academics in their classrooms and say, can you prepare your students for the jobs that we have? Because we're dying here. And that was sort of the idea. It was, it was as simple as that. How do we as employers find talent for the work that we have? So next thing we know, um, ALC Bridge is born and we were launched. This, this uh, beautiful website was, not, was launched in October of 2019 and we were on a roll. Um, <clears throat> I personally was scheduled to come to the University of Florida uh, and, and speak on campus for three days in March. Uh, of 2020. And of course, we all know what was going on then. So everything kind of came to a halt. But we've used this pandemic time, I think, very productively because we're doing this. We're, in some ways, we're seeing more of you. We're contacting more of you with our message. And the message is just this. We have created this place where employers and, 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 and academics can speak but it's for your benefit, it's for you. It's to show you what we mean by language services industry. And Kristen, I'll let you take the next slide and talk a little bit about uh, some of the jobs and things that we have available in this industry. All right, so um, as Kathleen said at the get-go for the, that at the opening, um, most of you probably haven't heard of the language services business or the language service companies. 
the language service business, those of us who, 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 who have companies and supply services is the biggest little industry you've never heard of. So I back up, I go to a cocktail party and I start telling people what I do and they say, well, that's cute. How many languages do you speak is always what they ask the first one. I said, embarrassingly, not one well enough. Well, one well enough English, but, but outside of that, but I've got 3,500 interpreters speaking 234 languages on demand and people are like, what the actual heck? What do you do? And then I back up and I said, at roughly $54 billion, the language services industry is a global $54 billion industry, larger than the global music industry. And people are like, what? That's a thing? Yes, it's a thing. And so we can talk about the careers and, and the opportunities in there. But what I need you to know is that it exists, it's growing, and it's not going away. And and we, we get a lot we get a lot of questions about and there's a lot of topics at conferences. Uh, well, yeah, but what about technology? What about automated, um, you know, AI, artificial intelligence, automated voice to voice to text and whatnot? Well, I'll tell you, in Germany last year, I was a, a broad user of Google Translate, and it got me got me through a menu and I uh, well, um, and travel directions. But truly, humans. The communication between humans will never be replaced by technology. And there's an old adage, and not an old adage, and not very old adage in our in our in our that, that we talk about um, saying interpreters and translators will never be replaced by technology. Interpreters and translators will be replaced by those who do who who utilize technology. So what we're saying is linguists who are operating in this field, if you're not opening your head and embracing technology and the advancements of, of where it can get you. It is causing growth in our industry. So the broader access, uh, the broader identification of a need for languages. So let's just say you call you call a utility company and they have voice prompts in, in Spanish and, and Mandarin and, and Vietnamese, depends on where you're located. And that's good. And oftentimes it can get you through and it can tell you how much you're you know, you, 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 you owe on your bill and then that's done. But what happens when that call needs to be escalated? Without interpreting services, they would never have identified that there is a call that has a need that needs to be elevated. And that just broadens the access and broadens the reach for it, for the growth. And it happens all day, every day in our industry. Um, and so um, um, anyways, it's really cool. I've got this off that we're probably taking too much time, but, but, but Kennedy Space Center contacted us a few years ago. And they said, we, we don't know how to speak other languages, but what we do know is that 70% of the tourists that come to the Kennedy Space Center speak a language other than English. And we have a reservation line that they have no access to because we can't speak to them because we don't provide language services. I'm like, what? And I said, we've got to implement this. So we did and we, we changed the inequities of you know the tour. You have to get on a tour in order to visit Kennedy Space Center. And, and they all showed up and they didn't have any access to it. So them providing language access and I, and I toured Kennedy Space Center that day, I went back. And um, I went through the gift shop because you have to buy guest stuff at you know, Kennedy Space Center. Went through the gift shop and I was telling the clerk what we did. And he's like, wait, we need people in here. Can we use the phone service? 70% of the people there were buying gifts and they had no way to communicate. Anyway, it was brilliant. And they asked me back six months later to go to a rocket uh, launch, which was pretty cool. Anyways, that's just my story with Kennedy Space Center. But the broad need for uh, languages is just always, always increasing. What we don't do as a language company is um, go along with the individual people. We only so, so we don't go along with the traveler. We don't have individual payers. We service companies and institutions that service a broad um, network of, of people needing language services. Um, I went off on a tangent, Kathleen. Where are we? So. So uh, we, we, we've got another slide. So I, my whole world is interpreting and Kathleen's whole world was in education. But this world is so much more broad. And it's not necessarily that we're, we're going to depict the areas in which which one can focus when they want to work in the world of languages. But our economy our is so global with the advancement that, that, that you know, the, the, the access to information is moving at the speed of light. I mean, of course, the internet has wiped down all, all barriers, right, to, to access to information and the sale of goods and services. And all of, so all of a sudden, any major company is a global company. And they value those students coming out of an education that have a language or language, languages focus immensely over the regular candidate. And so it's just if you don't end up 
looking to work for me or somebody else in this space. I get it. Just know how valuable you are to a, such a broad group of businesses. So be proud of what you're doing and don't limit yourself and know that no career path is linear. <laughs> so because yeah. you decide to do this, it, it, look at my weird, I, who knows, who knows where you'll be, but just know that by you focusing and showing interest and learning about um, um, perhaps careers in language, know that it's not just limited there, but we're going to limit this talk to that. And so we, it, it, Kathleen, you want to talk about the slide we've got? Well, yeah, I mean, this, I, mean, this, 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 I just, I think this is just, you know, proof positive that it's, you can do more than teach. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, I, I talk to people now and I say, what are you? Well, I'm a language engineer. Okay. <laughs> and who do you work for? Well, I work for Spotify. Okay. Um, localizers. I mean, uh, I mean, it's the, the 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 employers are not the, the language services industry incorporates not just our language companies, but obviously incorporates the big corporations, the Netflix of the world. Netflix are huge consumers of language services, obviously. Um, and so, for you as students at this stage, in this time, in this place, it's so so exciting. And of course. We as employers are looking for not necessarily even language majors. We're looking for people who know something about the world and can do something with language. Um, I was on a, a, a Zoom call just recently with um, a, a, a speaker who was talking about uh, testing and evaluation, testing and the need for coding and the need for working with something like called R. And, and th this is where we're going and this is where we're, we're at. So if you, if you bring together your language plus, you will be picking your, you, you'll be picking your, your careers. Kathleen? Yes. Um, you mentioned localization and, and I included it in the description of this program, but yeah. I, at your recommendation, I have no idea what that means. Can you t talk a little bit about what does that mean? Well, localization is a relatively new, um, new service in the language industry, in the language services industry. Um, it is not to be confused with translation. Translation translates the document or translates the, 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 the written word but the localizer has to fine tune it. So if you think, for example, of a web page, um, you need to localize it, literally take the text, take the graphics, takes the entire feel of that tr translation and make it local. So will I appreciate your website if I'm seeing the right images, the right colors, the right uh, text, uh, text, all of those things. So localization is huge. Um, in fact, we're beginning um, to see courses being offered on campuses strictly in localizations. In fact, I think uh, Joe will be talking to Adam, um, I think uh, very shortly here, about putting uh, together a little module, online module about localization. Mm -hmm. It's uh, in high demand right now. Mm -hmm. And in the chat, um, the the chair of the Spanish and Portuguese studies just just said, just kind of echoed your words that uh, that globalization. Uh, I'm sorry, that localization is such a, a really cool and uh, and kind of dynamic and emerging trend in in language uh, in the language industry. So that's that's really good to know. Let's see. Good. Um, I think we have time if, if, if we would like to have, if students have, if you can take a couple of questions or if you, sure. whatever okay. you think, um, or we can talk some more, however you would like to proceed. Well, I'm, I'm I, um, sort of interested in hearing from the students. I will open it up to questions. And if you, um, let me stop the share so we can get back to face. And, and just um, so that you know, students, we'll, we'll end with a, um, with a slide that gives you the, the website and um, suggestions as to what you can do right now to come in and post your resume, et cetera. Oh, I love that little kitty cat, Joseph. That is so cute. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I think we can, you know, let's take some right. questions. I mean, we, well, we brought you just a little teaser uh, of what is truly a, a, a monumental experience and we just remain unknown and we're putting into that. We are changing it. <laughs>
So I will encourage um, those in the audience, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat um, and, I'm, and I, can, we can, I can pass them along um, to, to our guests. Um, uh, as we wait for those questions to kind of populate, uh, the chat to populate with questions, um, you know, are there other specific, you, you kind of mentioned um, the fact that you know, people need language skills, but they also need to have a general idea of, of how the world works and that sort of thing. Are there any specific skills or knowledge or things that students should be doing in addition to um, uh, developing language skills um, while they're at the university that, that might be good for them to know about? Take advantage of study abroad programs if they're available and if you can, and if you can't do it in college, do it afterwards. But there's, you know, only so much you can get by reading and studying, um, going and immersing yourself in a culture and opening yourself up to travel with no agenda. The lessons you get from that, you can't draw out in a resume, but the, what you can bring forward as far as greatly offering to a company or being able to offer to your skill set is unmatched when you have got a, a, a global experience. Um, mm -hmm. So we really, really encourage that. And don't put it in the background just to say that was such a fun year in Greece. No, you carry that forward, that message forward because we value this, but also corporations don't necessarily just do languages. They value the more global citizens. So it is just, it is something I really kind of hammered into my kids and will to anybody um, that, that I listen to just if you can't afford or justify a study abroad program, go afterwards, youth hostels are super cheap. Um, and if I could add uh, another suggestion, I think it's, you know, you have an opportunity and we're putting it together here on campus for you for internships. Um, and it's uh, internships, this happens to be in the, in the, in the over the phone uh, space, but we're hoping to build on that and bring more opportunities for you to see. And it's looking to me, Joe, like we're going to need localization in a hurry because right. I don't know anything about localization except what I told you. <laughs> <laughs> so well, the next we will bring the experts in. Um, when you go on the ALC Bridge website, which I invite you to do as uh, soon as possible, uh, and you look at the committee you'll see a committee of both um, educators and um, employers, obviously, and you will see a range of skills. And um, the, 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 the whole plan is to be able to meet your needs. And um, one of the committee members is uh, Adam Wooten, and he's just a stellar fellow. I mean, he is inspiring and he has given his time on, on in, settings like this one. And I think we're just going to be talking to him here at the University of Florida, right, Joe, yeah, about yeah. localization. And so you might be able to have something that we put together for you in more detail. So I'm not going to talk any more about it because I'm sure that he would be upset with me. It's, a, well, it's, a, it's, it's very interesting, very fascinating, and very much in demand. One of the questions that have popped up, what are your recommendations for getting into localization? So is that something, we'll pass on that for the time being. I think so. We'll leave it to someone who can give a proper answer, not just one that an entrepreneur has made up, you know. So so what, what Kathleen is, is referring to is that um, Beyond 120 is in the process of creating an online uh, module that is instructional and help, will help students understand and gain access points to the language services industry. So be, be on the lookout for that. Um, let's see. Um, what type of certifications are required or might be required from a prospective language uh, employer? You want to go first? <laughs> Certification is actually generally pretty new. So there's certification for legal interpreters and that's been around for quite a long time, but for, and for ASL, and for health, uh, American Sign Language. Well, but that's emerging, that, that's new. Yeah, yeah. So there has been, I mean, new, we're saying six, seven years, Kathleen, am yeah, I right? CCHI yeah, yeah. and yeah. there, there are two, uh, two um, certification bodies here in the United States, which will certify healthcare interpreters, but in a very limited number of languages. But the industry is trying and the users are trying to say, okay, cool. Do you just take somebody off the street and, and throw them into a healthcare thing, what, you, you, setting to interpret, which is dangerous if this, if this, if this person is embedded. Our, lang our company happens to have certified languages international. So, we got, so do we certify? We do. We've got a huge part of our company is in the investment of testing and vetting quality interpreters. 
Um, and so that's what we do, but that doesn't prevent somebody to start a little company and not care about that. So what do we do to help make sure that we've got quality and qualified and, and, and it's, it's, it's emerging. It exists and, and we, and, and industry favors the interpreters who have been certified by one of these organizations, but we, but it's still a very, very small percentage. So certification exists, it's growing. Uh, but it's right now not not terribly regulated. So it, it belongs to on the shoulders of the company owners to make right. sure that and, you are doing the right thing by vetting, you know, your and, quality. And Kristen, you might mention uh, the ASTM standard. Yes, as far as language companies, we <laughs> we have been working for way too many years on uh, finding a standard that 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 uh, that a language company could measure against could go through an audit to say that, you know what, you have got the stamp of approval. And we went through ASTM to develop these standards. Kathleen worked very hard on this uh, to develop standards for, in our world, what does a language services company look like? We underwent the certification process. And it was not, I mean, it was, I mean, you've got to show revenue of over X number of, you know, million dollars over the course of three years, small, but not, but not limited. We just want to make sure that our industry it gets a bad rap when you have, and it happens, um, people opening up a, a business out of their black bathroom closets and just going and throwing the lowest price solution out there. How do we make sure that companies are vetted and companies are qualified? And so it's a two-day audit that takes weeks and weeks and weeks to prepare for, but just to make sure that, that you are a bona fide, successful company that can demonstrate your practices, your best practices. So we do have standards now. Yeah, through the ASTM yeah. for measuring the, the you know the the quality of a language company, and we do you know, but the, but it's all emerging. Um, Thank you, Kristen. If I could just add, um, so students, a new inter industry means a new industry, which means we have to go through all the baby steps, and this whole even the word certification uh, is often misunderstood because people will say they're certified, but that just means what they have a certificate maybe. So we're, we're hesitant. What we, what we like to say is we're looking for professionals and you can prove your professionalism um, with your credentials. And you're starting with your, your diploma, your, your from the University of Florida. Um, and so you, you, you have to build your own uh, portfolio in some ways in terms of your credentials. Um, the, there's the lots of coursework in there. There's, there's a lot of coursework available yeah. on becoming a professional interpreter and exactly. on the standards. So there's exactly. a lot of opportunities out there. And, and set your expectations. There's no, there isn't a, an obvious, um, you know, the, right currently there's no sort of obvious way that you can say, okay, now I'm, now I'm a translator. You have to get, do it on the job. Um, I mean, people can be amazing linguists. Um, but they can't translate nor interpret because the brain does totally different things. And I always use myself as an example. I, I'm trilingual, but you wouldn't want me, uh, aside from helping you perhaps with the French restaurant, uh, you know, in, in the hospital with you because I'd be stopping and thinking about, well, is that the right thing? Uh, an interpreter doesn't do that. An interpreter is like, a, it's like a, they're like machines. They just... Phew, um, and they have uh, cognitive abilities that have been developed. They're skills. You'll need to work them. You'll need to be tested. You'll need to be, you know, exposed. You have to sort of practice and work it. And so internships, I think, may be the key. And it's I, this being involved with ALC Bridge has really helped me to see that. But first, we had to give you a place to be an intern. Um, how can you know what to do in our companies unless you come and kind of take a peek? So, you know, stay tuned for that and begin looking. If you start looking for companies, you can ask, you know, do you have internships? Even if it's just a short one for the summer or whatever. So you can try, what does it feel like to be a translator? That you can kind of test on your own, but interpretation needs, you need a live setting. Um, well, a, a virtual live setting like we're doing. So I think, you know, don't understand that this is nascent. There isn't, a, we can't just say, oh yeah, here you are, here's your degree. And here's your, the, the, the piece of paper that says you are an interpreter, you are a translator, you are a localizer. Um, no, this- will Kathleen, come somebody, with, somebody popped up in the chat that they were, they were looking on the website, on the ALC Bridge lab website and wasn't able to locate any um, internship positions. Um, or I don't, they're on there. I don't think there's anything posted right now. 
So that's the other thing I have to explain. I'm so glad you're looking. Um, this is a platform that's new and it's been kind of lying un unseen and unpoked about uh, through the pandemic. We need to have two things happen. The employers have got to post their jobs, including their internships and the students have to post their interest, their resumes or whatever. Uh, that's what it's meant to be, what it's created for, but right now, Actually, with with the dearth of again, it's a new um, you know it's it, it, this is a new product. Um, I suggest Kathleen, this is your baby, but but post your resumes and your interest. Yes. Then build it, and they will come. Yes. Maybe come first, and it will be built. So we're, we encourage you to to show interest and, and post a resume. Right, and that's the last that the last yeah, slide that we were going to put up, yeah. um, which is just simply there is uh, within the the, the uh, ALC Bridge website, which is already ready with lots of resources and things. The ALC Bridge has a separate, um, totally separate website, and it's called Careers in Language. And when you go there, that's where you can post a job and poke around and look and see what's going on. Um, but again. Um, I'm the first to tell you it's pretty quiet. Uh, that's why we're on the road, uh, trying to get the word out and so delighted with the, the participation that we see here today. Spread the word. Kathleen, are you able to talk about the language line internship that, uh, program that, um, that Beyond 120 is, is, yes. is a, part, a part of? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so I, I mentioned the, the um, you can take this slide down okay, if you sure. want. Um, the, the, the ALC Bridge, Bridge project, uh, as I said, brings together employers and, um, and uh, educators. And one of the committee members is a gentleman named Frank Perry. And he just so happens to be the vice president of um, human resources for one of Kristen's good friends and serious competitor, uh, and that's Language Line. And they are a company much like, uh, much like Kristen's. They, they, they focus on over the phone telephone, over the phone, over the phone interpreting. And um, the, because he's on the committee and he's, they're committed to this, this bridge, um, they are working with the University of Florida in creating, I think, the first internship program. I think they're starting with Spanish, but um, I don't know how they find it or what they how it works from your end, uh, Joe. So you'll need to guide them to. There's a list of people that I guess are, but it, it's open. Um, it's it, they've gone through the the first testing, you know, uh, period, and they're taking candidates. So again, this is you know we're you're part of the beginning here. Um, and I, I think uh, you'll be excited if you go to work for, uh, for Language Line. And if you don't like it there, you can say, heck with this, I'm coming to work for CLI. <laughs> now that I've got some training under my belt, I'm ready. <laughs> and um, one, one student is asked, for someone learning a language that's not wi as widely spoken as languages like Mandarin and Spanish um, that, that, that are in super high demand, um, what are some of the things that they can be doing to acquire the right skills to get a job? And I assume that there, you know, you had mentioned earlier that you're looking for all sorts of languages. It's not just the high demand Spanish and Mandarin um, and, right. and so on, correct? I, yeah, you know, look into training programs for, uh, for professional interpreters. And there is um, just out of the gates there's something called Bridging the Gap, um, which is a great course. Um, and there is, there's a lot of information um, if you do do a search on where do you get the training to be an interpreter. A company like ours and even a company like Language Line does not train an interpreter. We're not a training ground for bilingual students or bilinguals period to become an interpreter because there's broad avenues out there to becoming an interpreter. So if that's where your passion is in the spoken interpreting world, uh, go get training practice and practice and then and then come demonstrate those skills so so to be fair but there's there's a wide world of jobs that are not just the linguist portion of it as we indicated earlier Kristen, do you remember geo's uh what his um yeah. training uh, um is it tra interpreter training what is his name um the language the language group um yeah, the language actually group. 
yes, so language group does. There's there's a lot of companies out there that do language yeah. training. A lot of that are focused in in the training and the training of professional linguists. So you know, as Kathleen has indicated earlier, and as she demonstrated through, don't put me in a medical setting, uh, because you are bilingual does not make you an interpreter. And there's two kinds of interpreters actually that you'll find out. There's consecutive interpreting, which is oftentimes referred to as stop and talk. So I say something, the interpreter interprets it. And then they interpret it back and it goes back and forth. So that's consecutive interpreting. And then there's simultaneous interpreting, interpreting, which is conference interpreting. It's broadly used at the UN. Um, it is uh, it is interpreting in near real time. So oftentimes you'll see people wearing a headset. And, um, and so one language will come in and simultaneously at the same time or near time, of course, they will, they will be um, um, speaking. That's a very, very highly skilled um, area, but really cool opportunities in that in that world of, of conference and um, and UN style interpreting. Um, uh, Joe, I'll put together a list of resources for training. Can you get it out to the students? Yes, I can do that. Yeah, Cro we, cross cultural. We yeah, Kathleen, you know. Hmm? Yeah, cross cultural. We we can meet offline yeah, and, yeah, and, we'll, and, we'll put together and put together a list, a list of resources for you because that's an excellent point. How are you supposed to get there? Right. Um, and we do have colleagues. There's plenty of, of resources for you. Uh, so we'll get that out. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to emphasize, you know, um, a lot of a lot of students are people who are studying languages, but, you know, there's there's room in the field, obviously, for native speakers and for right. heritage speakers. Correct. Yes. I mean, yeah. Absolutely. Um, um, I, I sit on a board in Washington, D.C. called the Joint National Committee for Languages that really emphasizes the push for funding in language education, um, as well as the seal of biliteracy. Um, so if you are a native speaker coming from, um, you know, coming from Mexico, let's just say, you know, years ago, the thought was, you know, forget your Spanish learn your English, you're in America now, this is, you need to be in America. But what we are promoting is the broad embrace of dual language immersion and the seal of biliteracy demonstrates that it's available in most every state. It's at a high school level of saying, you know what, we value your language, your heritage language speaker. We value that and the skills that you learn. And we also value learning the English. How do we recognize that you are a true dual citizen? And we, we've established that through the Joint National Committee for Languages that I sit on. A, a, a something that honors that, which is, a, it's a seal. So it's a test at the end of the day, but what we want to do is, is really value the heritage speakers, but understand is that um, understanding both cultures is so, and becoming more recognized and more, more, more valuable as far as, um, you know, the seal is concerned and whatnot, so. Well, somebody just got their gold seal of biliteracy yesterday. Oh, Did it? It's in the chat. Oh. oh, is it? Oh, yay, congratulations. Yay, Taylor, good job. Um, we are just about out of time. Uh, I'm going to open it up. If there's any last questions, now's the time to throw them in the chat. Otherwise, um, I'm going to say thank you so much um, to both Kathleen and to Kristen uh, for taking the time to talk with us and our students. Um, as you can see, there's a, a tremendous interest in, in this particular industry at UF. And so I'm so pleased that both of you were able to come and talk with us. And um, to those of you in the audience, um, a recording of this will be posted as well. And, and I will get, once we've got the resources put together, I will pass those along to, um, to the people who attended in an, email, in an email or something like that. Um, is conferencing interpreting a lot more competitive since it's more niche? A lot more competitive in what way? There's not as many skilled conference interpreters as there are consecutive interpreters. So from an entry standpoint, um, is it compensated better? Yes, um, but um, does that answer your question? Is it more competitive? We yes, in a skill set manner. And, uh, huh? Oh, there you are. Hi, Grace. Hi. Nice to meet you. I meant just in being able to find a job, like are there less jobs available? Because it there are fewer jobs available, but there are also fewer interpreters with, this, with the broad skill set for conference interpreting. So I say, go for it. I, I know quite a few UN interpreters who, have, who and it's just a cool life. Um, you get to travel the world and go and, you know, in, interpret for dignitaries all over the place. It's pretty cool. I, I, I second that. Go for it, Grace. One of our colleagues, uh, you know, Na Naomi Bowman, I yep. mean, her company is Conference Interpreting and she, they have just, you know, they've conquered the, pan the pandemic by going uh, remote simultaneous. 
And so they're doing conference interpreting around the world now. So I would say, go for it. Also look at, we put, you write down these notes, Kudo platform, uh, which yeah, is a brand Kudo. new platform that has sprung up in the last few years, okay. which is a platform that does simultaneous interpreting in the chat box. So you can have a conference going on in English and you can choose which language you want and you can pipe it in through your headset. And so it, and that's Kudo. One of our very dear friends is, is one of the heads there, Barry Slaughter Olson. Uh, and he was a former, U, he's, a, he's a teacher at Middlebury Institute of International Studies, as well as working with Kudo, and he was a former UN interpreter in Russian. Um, so, but, but, I, but I think Kudo would be an interesting platform for them to look at, K-U-D-O. Um, There's just so much opportunity. It's just so exciting for us to welcome you aboard. Poke well, around. Th thanks for letting us just be us. This was really unscripted. <laughs> <and> we, <laughs> We just kind of went down paths, but I but it, it's been fun, and I appreciate all of your interest a lot. We both do. Yeah. Um, do you have time for one more question, or do you yeah. do? All right. Um, someone asked, "Do you have any uh, advice to improve the skills to become an interpreter?" So, what are what are the things that they can be doing every day to to be? We're going to tell you in the list that Kathleen's oh. going to send you. Okay. So stay so, tuned for that. You're asking an English literature major who barely speaks <laughs> English or French after three years of, uh, of college coursework. All right. Well, thank you both so much. It was a, but, it was a, uh, but it was great yeah. to, to have the chance to chat with you. And thank you to everyone in the audience um, for your for your attendance and for your questions. Um, and thank you all for showing up. We weren't sure if we'd have three or four or, or 50, and we had well north of that. It was yeah. really fun. Good Wonderful. stuff. Yeah. All right. Thank Go you. Gators. Thank Go you. Gators. All right.